So I'm delighted that um, Irving Finkel is joining us um, today to talk about Mesopotamian dream omens. And Irving is a very well-known curator at the British Museum. I've been to several of his talks before and I'm a huge fan of his work. I've got, hang on, where is it? I've got a couple of your books just here. The Ark Before Noah and Cuneiform that I picked up the other day. Cuneiform is, um, is instructions on how to read the cuneiform text so i haven't sort of got into learning cuneiform too much yet and it seems like a really sort of dense difficult um script to decipher because it's wedge marks and is often so densely packed on tablets as well so i look forward to finding out more about how you work with decipherment and um how long it takes you for example to read a dream omen on a tablet would be really interesting for me so Irving, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to host you. You've been you've been one of my dream guests for Virtual Dream Palace. I'm really, really excited to hear this talk. I've not seen you talk about dream omens before. Um, I know that you have done a lot of research into Mesopotamian ghosts, for example, and board games with the Royal Game of Ur and uh, your research into the reconstruction of the Ark as well from your Babylonian tablet. So I will hand over to you now, Irving. Thank you so much for coming along. Really appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much. Right, well, here we are this afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk to you under the title Mesopotamian Dream Omens. And uh, let's see what happens. In the first instance, it's important to clarify that the material we're talking about is from ancient Mesopotamia, which is modern Iraq. And it is the landscape shown in the paler colour on this map, which I imagine most people are fully familiar with. But the point about the landscape is it's divided from north to south by these rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris, which were responsible for the great fertility of the land and the development of the great cultures that took root there. And also for the name, because Mesopotamia means between the rivers, and that was the name that the Greeks gave to the heartland of this ancient culture. So all the stuff that we're going to be talking about comes out of the ground from ancient Iraq, ancient Mesopotamia. So the landscape, I should perhaps show you, this rather grim and intimidating landscape, is the sort of place where um, cuneiform tablets which is what we're talking about come out of the ground this is a mound a tell mound a typical example um, under the sun um, in in the south of iraq and these mounds uh, come about because people live in the same places for very long periods of time because the original grounds for locating a city or something in a particular spot never changed like easily defended or on good trade routes or this and that so people stay in the same place and even when they go others come on top and you end up with a small mountain full of archaeology and if you're one of those skillful and, and um, blessed archaeologists as you dig through the pots and pans you sometimes find inscriptions which when it comes to dreams are absolutely indispensable so this is a picture of a river and the point about it is the canal that the, the the banks of these rivers were lined with clay brought down from the north often free of um inclusions very high quality clay which was used for all sorts of purposes but also became their support system for writing and the writing was brought about by um, um a reed such as shown on the right cut at an angle about the size of a chopstick and these two things together the clay tablet made from the riverbanks and these reeds for 3000 years was their means of recording things and it's a jolly good thing that they decided to do that because these tablets of clay last in the ground for ages ever and ever and this is a modern drawing of how a tablet was written you can see very easily that the cuneiform wedges the triangular wedges are impressed into the clay by a stylus and the writing system allowed people to write their languages in full and subtle detail so the sumerian language and the babylonian language which are real languages like our language could be written down with all their nuances and subtleties for us to read all this time later so the topic of dreams is actually rather fertile in mesopotamian culture because 
among the writings, there are different sorts of resources. So one of the important things is that the dream, um, the recounting of a dream and what it might mean to the people involved, um, is a sort of literary topos which appears in many contexts. So, for example, on the left, we have a um, um, picture of Gilgamesh as he's depicted um, at the University of Sydney, um, standing there, uh, rather imposing. But in the narrative of the Gilgamesh epic, which has, of course, 12 tablets of wonderful literature, um, Gilgamesh has several dreams about his friend Enkidu, and they all have to be expounded, what they mean, what they imply for the future. And the Gilgamesh dream episodes in the whole long matter are among a whole group of important resources sometimes they occur in historical texts like when someone has a dream and woken up with a shock and they recover their speech which was lost and all manner of other events are brought to life within literary or historical accounts um, based on the dream phenomenon and on the right um, this is not a mythical or remote character of heroic build like Gilgamesh, but Gudea, who was king of the city of Lagash in southern Iraq, who was a priestly king, um, very interested in literature and language, rather an intriguing personality. He had a dream one day of great, great dimensions, um, which in which he was told he had to build a temple and how to build it and to get on with it. And Gudea, being a pious man with his eye on the future, built this temple exactly as described. And he wrote an account of it on two large cylinders of clay, I don't know, three foot high or something in Sumerian, detailing every step of the way about the dream, what he had to do and what he did. So one has the impression reading those things that Gudea, having had this dream and built his temple, never stopped talking about it. So before we go a little further, it's important to talk about what an omen is, because um, people know what ominous means. It's something noted, which is threatening. But the omen is is, is a well-established literary format, which um, is well attested in cuneiform sources, in Babylonian sources. And of course, in all the literatures of the world, the, 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 the simple structure is very helpful for conveying very pointedly, things which may or may not be connected. So in Babylonian, there's only one word which you really need to know, which is shum. And shum means if. And all omens begin with the word if. Then that, in fact, is the essence of the matter. So in Mesopotamian terms, you have your omen, your usually one line of text that fits in the tab that you don't have very prolix omens that go on and on and on, but normally a cause and effect thing. You have the protasis and the apothesis. So the protasis describes when A occurs, and the apothesis then tells you B, what will happen. Now, if you are interested in omens, you will discover that with ancient Mesopotamia, dream omens are only part of a much wider uh, resource because for at least two and a half thousand years of time, it was believed that men, I mean human beings, thoughtful persons, individuals in the world, um, could, with the benefit of devices or with the benefit of divine intervention and help, find out what was going to happen. They had this belief that uh, they, one shouldn't process through life blindly trusting to good luck, but wherever possible, guidance should be sought about many, many details. And they had a kind of structure, this protasis to apodosis thing, which was put to use in very many ways. So the biggest one is liver omens, when they took the liver out of a sheep and they looked for funny signs all about it. And this sign meant there was a kind of hole in the liver, this meant this, or there was a protuberance in the liver, this meant that. And they believed that the sun god um, wrote on the um, livers of living sheep messages, which when removed from the animal and examined by a scholar, could tell the king important information about, for example, a military campaign or something of the kind. So liver omens was a very famous kind. And then there was another kind called Shuma Alu, which is 
you're going along in life and something happens and what does it mean well a good example is you're eating a bowl of cereal and a lizard falls from the ceiling and lands in your milk so in the mesopotamian terms that was a highly ominous matter and needed to be investigated and all those sorts of chance happenings were meat and drink to the kinds of what we might call priests who were specialists in divination. They collected these things, they wrote down what they implied in long compositions. So sometimes it's a very small number, sometimes there are hundreds of tablets, and the dream omens are sort of in the middle. So if somebody dreams when they're asleep, such and such a thing, then the uh, implications would be, and when you look it up in the tablets, that will tell you what's going to happen. Now, before we go any further, there is a point which I think is important to clarify, that if you read about omens in Mesopotamia, which I hope you will, and even the dream omens, you will see that the translation of the two parts is always that, if A happens, B will happen. And um, although that is not in itself contentious grammatically, the significant point is this, that taking a prediction for the future on the basis of an event hardly ever allows a human being to have such certainty. And in real day-to-day -day terms, I think diviners who worked for the king, who might be consulted, for example, on whether we should go to war on Tuesday or Thursday, is not likely to say, go on Tuesday and everyone will come back and you'll be the winners and all the dead will lie around on the other side. Because what happens if it doesn't work and your army is massacred and only eight people come home afterwards? Tricky business. So my conviction is that the way these omens and also the omens um, for dreams work is that if A happens, you dream such and such a thing, it might, could, should or will happen. There are at least four nuances which need to be taken account of. So if the king says, you know, I had this dream, does it mean this? The diviner would say, well, it says in the tablets this, I wouldn't be surprised. Probably it will, but you never know because once in a while, and then he would say a whole lot of stuff to the king who would stop listening, but nevertheless, he would cover himself. So I think the protasis equals apodosis structure needs a little subtle manipulation. So the protasis, which is definite, has this slight range of possible outcomes. That seems to me inevitable. Now, we have a lot of omens of all kinds, and we have quite a lot of dream omens, and almost all of them are from the first millennium. That is to say, the period of the Neo-Assyrian kings who lived at Nineveh and Nimrud, and lived in the 9th, 8th, 7th century, and then after them, the Babylonian kings like Nebuchadnezzar, who in a way inherited their culture, and, and to some extent their library probably, and they also had dream records of this kind, um, down to, more or less to the end of the cuneiform period, about 1st century AD, there were probably still people who studied this kind of thing and understood them. So this one is Old Babylonian. It's in uh, Philadelphia. It, it, um, it's, it's, they're all in Babylonian. Um, there's no Sumerian omens, really. Um, it, it, here you have, I translated a few bits for fun. In, if you're in your dream, if you gaze towards the right, your adversary will die. If he gazes towards the left, his adversary will overcome him. And if you look backward, he will not attain his desire. So these are three things. If you're having a dream of a fight and you look this way or that, then the expert would know that mm, it looks has this kind of implication. And then below, if he's if you're if you're telling the person if his right eye flow, that's to say, leaps or weeps, sickness will appear. And if his left eye does, his heart will be glad. So you have um, phenomena A to B, which not intrinsically are connected. Um, but they are fixed together in the tradition. And to some extent, you have here the um, a, a crucial thing about the right and left, where they have their implications. And of course, everybody knows about sinister on the left being bad news and uh, um, from classical writings. So, so also in Mesopotamia, it was common that the right was going to be benevolent and the left 
not, but of course, with the first omen we have here, it's the opposite. So there's no fixed rule, but the importance is that you have such an alternative and such an alternative, and any given thing, any given reading, will likely have the two uh, possible meanings distinguished by one or other criteria. So almost all the tablets um, that we have for the, for the dream uh, corpus come from the library of this Ashra Barnipal, king of the world, king of Assyria, king of the British Museum, and the triumphant king of the most successful exhibition we had recently in the British Museum too. So everybody's heard of Ashra Barnipal. He was a proper ruler. He was king of the world. And he had a very strong interest in writing and learning and scholarship because as a boy, he was educated by a scholar called Balasi. And Balasi was a top-notch um, cuneiform um, scholar himself. And he taught the king, brought him up in scholarship, learning and thinking of meanings and thinking of words and interpretation. And he came became king not by being um, in a way it wasn't expected but he became king but the consequence was that he put together a very fantastic library i hope you've all been or all have been to see the Nineveh library in the exhibition it was a splendid thing we built a wall of tablets like this um i don't know why they're all put in order of size because they certainly weren't in antiquity but that was the idea there's about 130,000 35,000 tablets and fragments from Nineveh and we put out a whole lot just to give the idea. And some big, too big to hold. Some are very small and all the sizes in between. And they contain all kinds of marvellous things. So we have the Gilgamesh epic, of course. And we have lots of other myths and that kind of stuff. Hymns, incantations, spells, magical texts, medical texts, legal texts, lexical texts, um, historical texts. We have letters and correspondence of all kinds. So the library when it came to us, was full of treasure, absolutely full of treasure. And the small band of heroic Assyriologists has been reading it ever since. So among this mass, there is the corpus of text to do with dreams. And I'm just going to show you two other pictures first, because um, for a long time in Assyriology, there was a big problem that there were loads of tablets Altogether, we have 130,000 in the British Museum and not enough people to read them. There's never been enough people to read them. It's always been a problem. So that meant that they did their best, but for a long time, important things were never studied. And most importantly, things which go together, for example, duplicates from different museums, duplicates from different cities, which allow you to reconstruct a proper text, very complex work and things were scattered everywhere. And only gradually, did the, did the rule take hold that to do proper scholarship on a given subject, you'd have to find all the bits in all the museums with photographs or going and copying them out, bringing them into one place so you could then work out the original composition in all its fullness. And I mention this because of this man here who was called A. Leo Oppenheim. And he was the... the um, director of the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary, of which you can see some volumes on the desk. He was a marvellous Assyriologist, and among all his other responsibilities, he decided to write a book about dreams of the ancient Near East, especially the Mesopotamian dream book. So there's the cover of his book. It's been reprinted now, I see. And it was a marvellous thing because he wrote it. It was published in 1956 when I was five and rather too young to have got a first edition until much, much later. But it's a marvellous book because he got all the stuff under one roof and he wrote an introduction about dreams in general and about in the ancient world and about the vocabulary and he translated everything into proper English. It's a marvellous thing. And even though it's so old, it's indispensable for anybody who actually is interested in this dream literature. Although I discover that my friend... Elise Zomer, a good colleague and a fellow uh, serological lunatic, is planning on doing a new edition of all these things because, as you'll see with these tablets, they all are broken. Hold on, let me just show you. This is one of these dream tablets from Nineveh. So you can see there easily, it's made of clay, of course. It's been baked to some extent. 
and you can see columns of writing. And if you look carefully, you will see that on the extreme left hand side, there is what there are three there are three columns of writing. So uh, each of those lines is a single omen. So on the tablet, there were three columns on this side and three columns on the other side, which meant that the scribe who was collecting the omens together had a huge number to do with one particular subject. And they put them all together logically in one tablet. So if you were interested in dreams about fighting and arguments with the family, they'd all be in one place or dreams about dropping things and they get broken, they'd be in another place. So that when you had the whole set on a shelf, a diviner who might be approached with a complicated dream that he needs to explain would know where to go to uh, find the sections that are relevant to this particular dream. And the point about this is you can see the whole top is broken off, the bottom is broken off, and it's also been put together from three pieces. So there's one large bit, another large bit, and a small bit in the middle. And altogether, the surface area of that document is probably only about a third of the original, which was a hefty thing to be held in two hands. So this is the point that when the seriologists work on these documents, they always have things which are incomplete. And we have in the museum very large numbers of small bits. So that small bit in the middle was certainly joined by somebody, probably Oppenheim himself. But the bits at the top, which are gone, and the bits at the bottom are probably also in the museum. So this is a tantalizing thing because all work is sort of interim until the next bit comes along. And sometimes the most unexpected joins come and change the picture entirely. So that's the sort of documents that have to be translated. They are written in Assyrian script. The scribes who worked for um, Ashurbanipal were the top quality scribes. Now, this is a modern digital photograph, which you can zoom. I don't think I dare try zooming it on here, but you can see that this is a that one of the dream tablets in question. There are many joins have been made. Heroic work has produced this, this sort of um, strange seated figure with its knees and feet. But the other bits are probably going to be found sooner or later. And one day, we hope, all these documents will be complete. So this is a photograph where you can perhaps see more clearly that the, the, the inscriptions are very sharp. They're written by beautifully trained calligraphers. Every line is free of error. They are the most impeccable and wonderful manuscripts. So the uh, Zakiku, Zakiku is the ancient name of a series of tablets all to do with ancient dreams. So um, the, the, the people who worked in the Assyrian library, the king's librarians, were very systematic people. They put together the things which belonged together and they actually numbered them in a sequence. So, for example, that all the tablets to do with Gilgamesh, there were 12 separate chapters, each one on a tablet. Each had its number. They were kept together so that the control was there over the sources. And when it came to the Sakiku series, there were 11 tablets. So I've written out here the, um, the first line of each of the 11 tablets, because in antiquity, when you referred to a document, you always did it by its first line so the, the tablet one began zikiku zikiku dream god god of dreams so it's an appeal to the god of dreams that's how the whole 11 tablets begin then the next one and you can see the dot 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 because they're often broken so if a man in his dream dot 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 two dot 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 well that's not much use that's not much use but if you're lucky the tablet too you don't just have the broken first line but you have other lines as well and in some cases we only have the first line but we don't have the document so it's an ongoing process of hunting for treasure then the third one if a man in his dream makes a door the evil demon will head for him and the next one is if he makes a table if he makes a chair if he makes a this if he makes a that so there's a whole load of dreams which are the work of a, an artisan, nothing serious. You wouldn't think it was anything suspicious about it. But something about the dream is troublesome. And when the professionals are consulted, they know, aha, this means 
you better watch out because there'll be some demon after you. And what the connection is between, so to speak, carpentry and this demon is not explicit. Sometimes one can see there's a link between A and B. Sometimes you have a kind of smell. Maybe that's how it works. And sometimes you just have to take it on the chin. We have no idea. So this is a case like that. Then the next dream is if a man in his dream is clad in silver. So, well, that sounds pretty smart, suit of armor or God knows what. So you might think, well, that's going to be a good dream. He's going to do well. But on the other hand, if you dream of artificial opulence, maybe you'll be faced with disaster. But the thing is, we've only got the beginning of the line and like the one underneath and the one underneath that. So four, five and seven, we've only got the beginning. Then we have a bit more with tablet eight. If a man in his dream sees the god Enlil, this means long old age. So Enlil was god number two after Arnul and a very, very important god. And if you asleep and you see this god in front of you, it means you're destined to become an old person. And if a man in his dream enters the gate of his city, wherever he turns, he will not he attain his desire. So make of that what you will, but that's the fact. And if you sleep on your right side, and the dream is confused, dot, dot, dot. So probably in that tablet, the next bit will be if you sleep on your left side and the dream is such and such, but we only have the beginning. And then the last one, if a man has confused dreams. So these insipids, these first lines, the ones that the librarians kept in their records, give you some smell, some sense of what this series was like when full but quite a lot of the tablets are well preserved hold on i think we've gone a bit too far sorry just a second okay we've got that now we go to the next one now we go to the next one no one yes so this is a um a, a, another short quotation which gives you an idea at um, simply of how the protasis and the apodosis can have a connection which we can understand easily. So if a man dreams he's eating a raven, which in the Babylonian is aribu, he will have income, which is irbu. And there are many such omens like this. If a man dreams he's eating human flesh, which is not a particularly pleasant thought, then he will have great riches because flesh is sheru and riches is sharu. And finally, if someone's given him michru wood, a kind of wood, he will have no rival or mahiru. So these connections, of which there are many variations, play on an element of the Babylonian language, which is a crucial thing, because Babylonian, being a Semitic tongue, like Hebrew and Arabic today, is often formed on of words of three roots, like machiru is m or mem chet resh, where you can have michru and a machiru, and you can interplay the words um, with the same root or a similar sounding root to get these meanings. So aribu, the word for raven, has nothing to do with the verb irbu, which comes from a different actual root, but they have in common the weak vowel r and b, and that's enough. So that's how it works. It suggests something uh, which makes sense. So the other thing about it, which is important to put on your plate, is that there were specialists who, um, who, who, who dealt with this thing. But before we do that, I wanted to read you a couple of other things before we go any further. So um, reading Oppenheim's book this morning, um, just to get up to speed with this stuff, um, I discovered there's a whole run of these um, dreams about um, imagining going into the underworld. And I'm rather cross about this because I just written, published a book about dreams, about, about, about uh, ghosts. And I forgot that people could dream of this. It's very interesting. If he descends into the netherworld, he will die, but not be buried in the ground. If he descends into the netherworld and the dead appear, short days, and in his family there'll be cases of death. And if ditto, he goes into the netherworld and the dead appear, an evil spirit will seize this man, 
this man has received in the dream a reminder of the gods concerning impending doom. And there's about six more um, of this kind. If you are asleep and you fall deep asleep and you imagine going down into the netherworld where everybody went when they were dead. This is the last one. If he descends into the netherworld and the dead rejoice over him, uh, the rich will become poor. The poor will become rich. This man will die, but will not be buried where he was born. So that's quite a lot riding on that issue. But um, the serious point here is that many of the subjects in the dream book, which, of course, there are hundreds and hundreds of lines, do concern things which people worry about. Because, as everybody knows, dreams are a kind of purgative system, um, at least according to many persons, a purgative system and preoccupations of morbidity and other worrying things sometimes are vented in dreams. There is, for example, some passage in cuneiform where someone dreams that they're in the street without clothes on, which is a, a dream that lots of people have today. And um, it's a rather startling thing. And other, my, my, my own um, iterative dream, which always makes me wake up screaming, is I'm suddenly put in charge of driving a London bus full of people standing up and packed solid when I don't know how to drive anyway. So that is my reiterative dream, and it happens about once every three months. But I haven't yet found this in a Babylonian source. Now, the second thing is, I'm going to read you the short spell which begins the tablet, at the first tablet, addressed to this Zikiku, right? It says, spell, Zikiku, Zikiku, Mahmud, God of dreams, you live in the town of Akkad. Why have you left the town of Akkad? The confused dreams, who will remove them now? The town of Akkad, dot, 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 by himself. Oh, Shamash, you are the judge. Judge my case. You who renders decisions, render one for me. The evil dreams which I've had make favorable that I may walk the straight road. So this god, Zikiku, was believed to have his cult center in the town of Aga. And the principle often espoused in Mesopotamian sources is that if the god is happy and in his temple, having his sacrifices and regular service, everything is peachy. But if something comes along to disturb it, then the god gets touchy and moody and then leaves and there all things go out of the window. And this mammal is not there where he was supposed to be. And of course, in Mesopotamia, I should say that, oh well, um, simply that the Assyrian kings at one time obviously relied on having dreams very seriously in political matters because there was a small town called ba Balawat near, um, near Nineveh where um, kings went in order to have a romantic dream um, from, from the gods to get to tell the future. That's something which um, is, needs to be more investigated. And then we have um, part of the dream book that Oppenheim published, a whole group of things which are rituals to get rid of the evil implied by a dream, because this is the thing. If you have these the, these people, Mupashir um, Shunati, one who um, either communicates a dream or explicates a dream, the verb Pashar is a complicated matter, as Oppenheim explains but if you have a dream you can pasharu it to somebody else or another person can pasharu your dream to you so it's a kind of um offloading and dealing with idea and a mupashir shinati is a person who does this a kind of specialist and then there were the shah ilu and the female equivalent the shah iltu who were especially well qualified to deal with these dream things so the general principle is if you had a dream which was troubling, not just that you woke up and you forgot, but it stayed in your mind, or perhaps it was repeated, um, or you woke up screaming, then it might be sufficiently weighty that you would go um, and, and consult someone who was a specialist, who would have his library or know where to find the library to look things up and tell you. And sometimes there would have to be an ex a, a ritual that would get rid of the implicit evil. Like, for example, you make table and this demons after you well you don't want to just forget all about that you go along for special well, how do i get rid of this demon what do i have to do and the guy would have some suggestion hopefully which would be beneficial so these 
these spells, which is part of this compilation, for example, if a man had a wrong dream, he must, in order that its evil consequences may not affect him, say to himself before he sets his foot on the floor in the morning, the dream I've had is good, good, verily good before sin and shamash. Thus he shall say, in this way, he makes a good giru or reputation for himself and the evil of his dream will not come um, near him. So this is a very simple thing. It's um, uh, looking in the mirror saying, I'm the most handsome man in the world and no woman can um, um, resist me and then going off to um, a, a dance hall. Um, it, it's a good technique. It doesn't cost anything. You don't have to get anybody else to do it. But beyond that, most of the things probably meant that you had to get help from a, um, a specialist who might want a, a tip for his um, benefits um, uh, to get you out of your difficulty. So the thing about this archive, it's very, very substantial. Um, it's not complete, but it's on the way. And in the end, when it's all fit together, which I'm sure there'll be a lot of new progress, the result is a huge um, run of very detailed dreams where the subject matters are of course familiar to everybody who studies dreams in general but what's especially Mesopotamian about them is that you introduce a topic and then you run through the variations of it either by left and right sometimes by colour sometimes by number all those ph phenomena are there so that you can take what might be a simple core dream somebody once had which was full of implications and in compiling the reference work you extend it extend it as much as possible so that any other dream that might be dreamt in the future could be explained by means of this book so it was a sort of encyclopedia rationally organized where these specialists would have most of the answers that they needed um, because human dreams of course are shared and common um, one of the other things I wanted to mention is this, that um, we have dreams in literature, we have descriptions of the omens, what, if you see a dream, what it means, and we have magic to get rid of the dreams if they're really worrying and troublesome. And there's one other category, which is equally important, which is not actually um, seen the light of day yet, which is what you do if you want to have a mantic dream, if you want to solicit one. And there are two processes uh, whereby this could be achieved. One of them is what we call incubation, um, which always makes me grin. It's such a funny word because it makes you think of um, either babies or chickens. But um, what's involved, and it's usually a king who does this. I don't know about commoners, so to speak. But if there was a weighty matter where a dream was necessary, the king could go and sleep in the temple overnight and um, would have a dream come to him uh, which might be self-explanatory it might require um, um, exposition by an expert but there are several cases of this royal practice of incubation to get a message dream one of the ones i found in the bm was the kassite king kurigalzu um, who wanted to know whether his um, wife was going to produce a son or not and so he went to the temple and had a special sleep to get the answer. And the funny thing was, uh, he saw the main gods, they all came and talked to him about it. And there was a thing called the Tablet of Sins. And it was rather unfortunate because I think Kurigaza was thinking, no, of course you will. Don't, 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 don't worry. Or, well, look, get a couple more wives, man. I mean, just get on with it. But this thing, and it was about his wife called Katantu, which means very skinny, um, they, they looked things up in the tablet of sin so I it's a totally mean thing to do but as if uh, the fact that no son had come might be conceived of as a punishment for some misdemeanor in the past so the answer never came because that tablet like all the others was broken too anyway in the british museum to complement the work of the um dream expert whose omens we have in such number. Um, there's also a small number of very late tablets from third century, perhaps 
and maybe even later from Babylon, which give us details about what you do if you are a private person who wants to have a mantic dream. So by this time, the sort of time when there were Greeks in Babylon and others, people speaking Aramaic, probably speaking a bit of Greek as well as Babylonian, a later time in the history when things were changing, um, activities such as dream divination, which were when solicited, strictly speaking for the top classes and the king, by this time it become democratized so that a private individual who wanted one of these dreams could go to a person who crossed their palm with silver and tell them what to do. And there's a group of these tablets, which um, I'm hoping to publish quite soon, which tell you what to do. And they in in include some very interesting things. You go and sleep on the roof and you have to burn incense and um, make yourself receptive to the message. And there are two quite remarkable things about this small archive. One is this, that the, there's a particular plant drug which is prescribed in order to make you receptive, the face of the patient or the of the would-be, um, the person wanting the message, is anointed in oil with this plant, which is called anamiru. And anamiru occurs in um, dream divinations and one or two other things to do with divination. And it's rather interesting. We don't know what this plant is um, or whether it's an unguent or some. We don't know what it is, but it's applied to the face of the person. But the interesting thing is this. It's called anamiru. Well, in Akkadian, ana is the preposition meaning to or in order to. And amiru means a person who sees something because the verb amaru means to see and amiru is someone who sees well in english we have the word seer like prophet and um it's funny thing that one knows the word seer without thinking what it means because seer in english is a seer it's somebody who sees and it's exactly the same as this amiru in babylonian the seer so the plant is called for the would-be seer, for the seer, as the name of the plant. So this is another illustration of um, a, a link between a name and a meaning, which in this case is very literally pronounced. Now, the other thing which has come out of this archive is also interesting that um, the, the, the bulk of the understanding of, of the, the, the Omen book of um, Oppenheim is that the dreams which come are not solicited. They're things which come to you. You don't go out of your way to get them. And there is a kind of idea that the, the, your God, personal God or other gods, has something to do with the whole matter. They're in the background and can be appealed to, like Shamash and the moon gods seem in that spell, that they have something to do with it all. But it's all a passive matter that as it were, you have a trouble, you have a worry, you go to sleep, and then something happens in your mind about it. It's not people looking for a letter or a message. That only applies to the incubation by kings and this late archive. And what happens here is you're up on the, it's a swirly incense, um, very heady material, and you have this stuff and you wait for the message. And what it describes in one of them is that the Zakiku, god the god or mamud or god of dreams lives in the underworld where the dead are and lots of other weird persons like demons and uh, other wicked specimens they all live down in the netherworld and most of them are supposed to stay there but the dream god is down there and when there's a powerful spell appealing for a mantic dream such as in this document here then some messenger from the dream god down there brings the dream up by a ladder there's a special dream ladder and that operation seems to be independent of the great gods and other gods of the temples who are all around this is a special thing where you um you uh, send a message to this the mammoth who sends a message by one of his underlings who climbs up the ladder and suppose hands it over to you one way or another or whispers it in your ear so 
with the few scrappy tablets from Babylon, we are now able to put into perspective the great inherited library of Nineveh with all its 11 tablets with hundreds and hundreds of lines on, because they are based on stuff from the second millennium of the time of Hammurabi, like the first one I showed you. That's an old Babylonian tablet. There are not many of them. But all the stuff in that big compilation really comes from the second millennium. And these late tablets represent something different. They've thrown off the shackle of all that stuff. People could go in the market. There'd be somebody with a thing in the window. You go in there and knock on the door and... Um, uh, they would know what to do and give you instructions and you would get a message, a special message of this kind. So that, I think, is good fun. And finally, um, this very serious um, 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 ancient drawing um, has um, a, a, a light-hearted effect or vice versa. A light-hearted drawing has a serious effect because um, one of the things about studying ancient inscriptions and ancient cultures is to sort out in your mind whether you regard the people who once lived, once used the archaeological evidence that's in the museum, things that you excavate on sites and wrote all these inscriptions, whether they are dead and irretrievable and without any kind of body or any kind of um, entity, they're just figments or shadows of what existed before and therefore are beyond our reach and not really understandable. Or you can take the other view that Homo sapiens from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, which was in the 5th century BC, if not very long ago, and in the time of ne um, in Hammurabi in the 18th century BC, that's not a very long time ago either, in terms of the time Homo sapiens has been on the globe and all the things that came before. So it's my working um, assumption, in fact, my deep held conviction, that the men and women of ancient Mesopotamia were no different from men and women today, except in superficial ways. That's to say their dress, um, their food, their religious beliefs, their this, their that, their customs. They obviously looked, so to speak, what we used to call oriental, and they ate local food, and they did this and they did that. But actually the Homo sapiens inside, the essence of the person, is in no way less evolved or different from what we are today. You have intelligent people and stupid people in antiquity, and you certainly have the same here. And people in antiquity could believe conflicting things easily at the same time without worrying like people do today. And all the other things, they were loyal and faithful and adulterous and wicked and so forth and so forth. So what we are dealing with is this, tablets and objects which must be peopled by people, not by shadows and flat, non-convincing elements and you can't overdo this but with the area of dreams this is a particularly compelling thing because the mechanism of the dream is an outlet for worry or suppressed fear or neurosis or madness or any number of other things in antiquity is matched by the same thing today and everywhere else in between this is a human situation and from the beginning of time, people thought that dreams were messages. They were a kind of letter. They had to be understood. What does it imply? And once you have this, you have experts who can tell you and they collect all the data in a very learned and scholarly way. So it becomes a discipline. It becomes a resource. It becomes a serious flag of their psychology. But the emerging psychology is not anything uniquely Mesopotamian but it is something familiar to anybody who looks at dreams in general or thinks about human beings as one species. And for that reason, I think they are doubly important. And I'm very glad to have had the opportunity of yelling at you this afternoon all about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, much um, Urban. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. I just plugged my headphones in so I could listen more closely to that. Um, I, that brought up a lot of questions. Um, let's do. Okay, we've got questions. I'll do my best. Yeah. Well, one thing I wanted to ask you, um, I was mentioning before about talking to Sophus Heller about um, dreams, especially in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and he mentioned this idea of 
dream interpreters having to untangle the knots of dreams. So I yeah. wonder about the sort of conceptualization of what dreams were and how they, um, how perhaps the perception of where dreams came from, the validity of the dream worlds um, for ancient people in Mesopotamia. Did they think they were entering some other realm when they dreamt? Um, that I don't know. Um, I think when you have a, a literary dream, which is explained, which is given in full and explained in full in terms of a narrative, then you have an awareness, um, perhaps more explicit, that the subject of the dream reflects some personal preoccupation and some crucial element of the unfolding plot. So there, that's a kind of maximum um, source material to analyse. And perhaps if you took the dreams of uh, the Gilgamesh epic and subjected them to a, a new um, a scrupulous psychological analysis, you might get somewhere about um, many things, but I don't think you get any answer about where people thought they went when they were dreaming. I don't think they went anywhere when they were dreaming. I don't think so. There's something about the idea of a dream like a letter. Mm. It has that thing like a letter. And when the letter comes, um, there's somebody who sends it, there's a recipient, and it has to be opened, it has to be read, and it has to be understood. And I think I think that's the sort of bag in which message dreams fit. And the the great resources of the dream, um, of Oppenheimer's dream book, which of course I only read you a few bits out there because there are hundreds and hundreds mm. of tons, it, it's compendious. Um, they're all purged down they're boiled down to the simplest thing if you dream of x it means y and it's nothing to do with personal experience it's a it's a kind of phone book of subject matter so you can only analyze those in generic terms about what humans dream about and that is different from what gilgamesh dreamt about in that story so the two resources are complementary, but they are distinct. But as to whether they had a conception that um, when they were asleep, they went somewhere, I've never seen anything which suggests that level of detachment. I think in a way, um, not, because the reception of a dream, you're passive, you're lying down and if you're sleeping. And if you if you thought you went somewhere, you'd have to have a concept that you were uh, you could be disembodied and fly off somewhere have an experience and come back and although that's a familiar thing in this general topic um, uh, uh, psychology and dreams and the whole basic topic i don't think there's any evidence at all in mesopotamia that they had that idea i don't think so well that that actually brings me on to my other question because it's a question i've asked egyptologists with regard to dream interpretation and accounts actually Evan, could i ask you to stop sharing your screen so that we can get a better view thank you oh, okay right that's better so um one of the things i've asked is i'm interested to find out about flying dreams in the ancient world because it's one of these things that i have wondered whether it's a modern yes. phenomena to dream that you're flying because we can now imagine flying in a way we flying planes uh, we can um uh see things on tv and film that show flying is flying something that's mentioned in ancient mesopotamian dreams ever yes in 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 um oppenheim's thing there are um dreams about flying i don't know if i can find them immediately but there's a whole there's a run of dreams about if a man dreams he's flying here drawing here and there and, and that and that and i think that means literally like a bird but yeah um, i i don't think it, you can you can um postulate that you can only have a dream about dream about that if you've been in an airplane or you know about airplane mm -hmm. because you you know the babylonian map of the world have you ever seen that yeah well everybody describes the map of the world as um, a bird's eye view, because mm. the whole of Mesopotamia with Babylon and the Persian Gulf and the Euphrates and the ring of water around it and the mountains is shown from above. So nobody in Mesopotamia never had no aeroplane. So the, the view of the world from above in that map was purely imaginary. 
Um, so the same thing would apply with um, Mesopotamia. Um, they took omens from birds. They sometimes released birds. And when they flew in such and such a direction or such and such a direction, this was an, a, a form of divination too. And they knew all about bird species and they sent messages with them and they ate them and all the rest of it. So they knew all about birds. So you don't have to be a genius to think about being able to fly if you're on the ground and you see things flying. So yeah, absolutely. It's all, it's all natural to me. And the other mm -hmm. thing is, which is most suggestive, that the map of the world... Um, which is so far without any parallel, has a colophon at the back which explains about the name of the man who wrote it. And the, the man's name is broken, but his father's name is there, and his father is called Itsuru, and Itsuru means bird. And um, nobody in Mesopotamia was ever called bird. They just weren't. But his father was called bird. So if his father was called bird, and he had a, so to speak, bird's eye view of the universe, there's some connection there so wow that's a fascinating i did, had no idea about that that's really interesting the, yeah. the the world of the map is on display at the british museum it's like a palm-sized tablet in a yeah. case on its own right i've seen that that's, that's really interesting also there, there was somebody who went up to heaven on an eagle's back mm. um, so i i think the map of the world might be something to do with that story mm. um looking down you know like in c.s lewis or something but well that's I, something that i found fascinating because um when i spoke to when i've asked about flying dreams in egypt there hasn't been much evidence of it which i found really surprising because as you say i can imagine that people saw birds flying and could imagine themselves yeah well, there are, the world from that point of view in this great book by oppenheim there are a, a, a dozen or so omens about a man dreaming of flying so uh your, your question is answered um, right. But um, it, it, if 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 Elise really does manage to make a, a much fuller text of it, it'll be a, a, such a storehouse of information. It's really, yeah. really, really, very important thing. Mm. Elise Zoma, who having mentioned, is has submitted something for the Dream Palace Symposium, and she may be someone we get on as a um, a virtual Dream Palace guest in the future as well. Mary, um, do you want to ask your your question? Yeah. First, I want to. Big thank you. This is absolutely rich information. Um, I live in the States, so I can't see the things that you can see in the British Museum, but the visuals are fantastic and uh, the information that tags along is wonderful. Um, I actually had another question, but your conversations about flying dreams prompted some thoughts with me. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, uh, last semester, I was looking at dreams buried within the Arabian Nights. So I know that the time frame is not right. But what's interesting to me are the flying horses, and of course, mythology with flying horses, um, and the magic carpets. Also sort of connote this idea of uh, flying. And there's an idea within the Arabian Nights tales that there are embedded dreams within the literature. So to me, it's sort of a curious connection to the, maybe the, some of the same parts of the world. And um, when you talked about the bird's eye view, I mean, the first thing I think of is remote viewing and out of body experiences, which people are trying to now scientifically prove as, as something truly that we're able to do. And, and I don't know how to make those connections. I'm just sort of, you know, um, a puzzle um, putter together of, of things. But one of my, so th those are just thoughts. Right. My question, my question that I was going to ask, um, we talk a lot about dream content and you talked a little bit about what I'm going to call dream delivery or maybe um, the style of dream. And you talk about um, the reading of letter, of a letter. Um, are there other, like, in, uh, biblically, I think there's like angel messages, um, and maybe other sacred texts, they have divine beings that whisper in our ears. I'm just wondering, are there other delivery methods of the dream that anybody knows about? Well, um, uh, that's a whole lot, whole lot of stuff in one go. I'm not <laughs> sure Sorry. that, um, um, I don't think they had out of body experiences. I don't think they 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 didn't have a level of um, introspection 
in, in, uh, as, as a characteristic and um, the, the societies in which um, those sorts of achievements are mentioned usually come as a result of extreme introspection and um, meditation and concentration that stuff doesn't seem to me to have anything to do with Mesopotamian culture I don't think you could demonstrate it I think in general terms it um the the, the the caliph in Baghdad um, must always have had a, a dream interpreter, or probably two in his court, and they no doubt had. Um, I mean, there are Islamic dream ma manuscripts. Um, no, no doubt that the, the caliph um, uh, would would have opinions about dreams that he or anybody else important to him might have had and experts who answered it and i think there's probably a kind of um tapestry of tradition about this stuff which means that if they things resurface in the arabian nights for example not in remote degree surprising to me but they may well in core be very ancient or much more ancient than the arabian nights themselves because um there is a point about dreams um even in the modern world that m most people don't remember their dreams and sometimes you have a dream which is um very frightening and very shocking which takes you a day to shrug off something like that or um very frightening or very realistic and if you have a dream like that um the purgative treatment by some other counselor can often be essential can often be essential especially if people have um, psychological trouble about the subject and sometimes dreams can take a person you can wake up screaming and you're drenched with perspiration and horror and you can't believe it hasn't happened and w when reading about ancient dreams that also is part of it it's not somebody had a nice nice dream while they were asleep and got up in the morning and went to work and suddenly remembered no it, it's it's it, the, the, the reason for the concentration on it as a topic is its capacity to be very very disturbing i think that's essential but otherwise i you know, i can't really answer most of your questions um from what i know about mesopotamia uh can i ask a question Okay, yeah. Sarah, you're muted. Sorry, um, Beatrice, do you want to ask your question? Uh, oh, uh, there was a message that Sarah, you wanted to wanted me to not mute, so I I unmuted, but suddenly oh. it muted again. So uh, what I have to oh, do, okay. can I ask a question, or <laughs> I have to wait some, some, something, or what? Um, Beatrice, did you want to ask your question? It's just been in the waiting room for a while. I mean, I can ask. Beatrice asked about um, the mechanism of the Sumerian me. Uh, M E. Yes. Okay, that's slightly off topic, but um, there was a, a a conceit in Sumerian thinking that. Um, phenomena in society which um which were power sources which enabled phenomena to happen um were under divine control and were almost um like physical objects which you could keep in a shopping bag and the people usually call them pronounce it mave in sumerian to mean these things and there was an equivalent word in babylonian and nobody has really the faintest idea conceptually of what they were thought to be except that the maze controlled so many things they were very important and god stole them from one another they were uh, um they were people were jealous contentious and the maze was stolen and retrieved so they were like um uh, i i think you might consider them as a collection of um travel cards or something like that that they the, the one for writing one for this one for that and it, 
if they were in the right hands, everything would work. And if they weren't or they were stolen, then everything would grind to a halt. They were very important. They're much more important in Sumerian thinking than later. They reduce themselves. It's, it's not a major preoccupation in Mesopotamia, but it's a topos in Sumerian literature more regularly. Great, thank you. Um, Yong Min, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for a great lecture, Irving and Sarah. It was very awesome and it was very be beautiful. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first is, maybe I missed something, but why Assyrian librarians collected dream tablets for helping kings or ordinary people? And right. the second question is, it's very interesting that is it was bad omen when the dead appear in dreams. Is it interpretation that only existed in ancient Mesopotamia or other nearby regions such as Hittite, Levant, and ancient Greece and Egypt did? Especially how ancient Egyptian interpreted dreams that the dead appear? Right. Well, um, the first question is a good question. Um, Ashurbanipal was a very learned person, as I said, and he had a plan to bring under his roof all the traditional knowledge that had ever been written down on clay tablets under his control in his library. That was his plan. And he wanted all these things to be brought together and to be written out in very neat handwriting and at his disposal. So this wasn't a library that anybody else could utilise, although I think the top scholars who were colleagues and knew the king well, probably could sometimes use the library. I wouldn't be surprised. But all the omens and all the other things that were ever written, they were edited in Nineveh in the best kind of condition and ordered, as I said, in these series. And they were meant to be a state of the art. And um, it's not so much that, uh, um, you know, all the medicine and the lexical texts and all the other scientific things were all collected together and tidied up by these by these librarians so that the king had the most up-to-date reference tools ever under his control that was the idea and the lucky thing about it was that when Layard was excavating there in the 19th century they found he found this library of course it was damaged and broken um which was a state-of-the-art library so I, I think the king had a um, a, a driving conviction that he needed to see everything and know everything that had been found. And um, it's a good thing he did. Good thing he did. So that's the first thing. The second thing, is, but it wasn't like a lending library. You could go along on your bicycle and take three tablets out over the weekend. It wasn't like that. Now, the other, the other thing you ask about, the dreams that I know about in Mesopotamia to do with the dead are not dreams that you see the dead, but dreams that you go down to the underworld. In other words, that means that you are dead, um, which is a slightly different thing. And I don't know whether in Egypt they have dreams like that. I'm, I've never done any work on Egyptian dreams. But th th it's a very specific matter that you, you dream that you're, you've gone down to the underworld. In other words, that you have, uh, since falling asleep, died, <laughs> as it were. Reminds me a little bit of that kind of urban legend when I was a teenager in the 80s, that if you died in a dream, you'd die in real life. Was there that conception in Mesopotamia that you know of? Well, I don't know. I mean, everybody knew they were going to die. Mm. Um, um, and I don't think it bears on that. I mean, I think, I suppose if you dreamt you went down to the underworld and then when the cock crowed, um, you woke up. Um, early in the morning and found you were still alive you'd be rather pleased mm. um i want to ask a little bit about gula and nanshi like two goddesses that i know are involved in dreaming in ancient mesopotamia gula seems to be more related to healing dreams and receiving perhaps um, guidance from gods especially that goddess in terms of the sorts of remedies that might be required by a patient in one of her temples and yeah. Nancy, who's more um, dream divination. And the, I've read something and then there, I can't find very much evidence for it elsewhere about Nancy's priests going through some kind of near death ritual in order to enter the underworld to um, learn the future so that they can bring that kind of prophetic talent back to human beings. 
I don't know what that is. That sounds rather fishy to me. But um, um, Nanche is the older goddess. Um, mm. When Gaia built his temple, when he had his dream about building the temple at Lagash, she she was involved in it. It was under her. As a, she was the living goddess um, in the in the whole matter, the Sumerian goddess. Gula comes along a bit later, and. Um, she doesn't have anything to do with divination, as far as I know. She is in charge of medicine and um, in charge of the whole of medicine, that's to say drugs, th therapy, um, spells, and so forth. Um, and there was a Kassite temple to Gula where um, when people were sick, they could um, say they had gout in their foot or something. They, they would take a small clay foot to the temple and leave it there or hang it up somewhere um, so that the goddess would remember that um, she had to look out for this problem and make it better. And if you go to many places in the world, you will see trees with limbs like that, made of clay or something, hung up with little messages saying, to our lady of this or our lady of that. And in, in, in all religions, this sort of thing happens and Gula was was just like that so she was an accessible goddess and um friendly um, and she was associated with dogs right as well so dogs were kind of like the guardian of people yes, yes she, when she they had, visited her temple yes that's that's correct but this thing about what you mentioned before about going down I'm not quite sure what that would be I, I yeah don't... there's only one reference I found to it and it talks about um the attendants at the temples of Nanshi going through a kind of initiation rite that involved a I mean there's not there's I think there was something mentioned about them taking some sort of um hallucinogenic substance in order to to die so that they have that experience of being in the netherworld and then right. they therefore are blessed with prophetic gifts but I like you say I can't find any other evidence for it there's just this one mention of it that i found i'm not, not familiar with that inscription it, it, there is the serious possibility that the person who wrote about it had been taking hallucinogenic <laughs> that was that actually brings me on to my next question you mentioned this um plant um that enabled mm. people to see dreams do we have any idea of what that may be in modern kind of botany no but it's consistently used um it, it it's it's um, with ghosts and with th this kind of dream things, uh, three or four different contexts, and there's a myth about it that one of the gods goes up the mountain to get this plant and brings it down. So it's quite important. But mm. what it was is bot botanically um, unknown because with lots of plants, there's a description of the color and the leaves and the seeds and this and that, and people can hazard a guess that it might be that. But in this case, we just have the name, and I, I don't know what it is. But um, I would think, all things being equal, that it might be the sort of stuff that if you put it on, uh, made your eyelids tingle or something like that, mm. um, or something. But, but there's no evidence about it. And when, when I remember you mentioning, um, I think you were doing like a YouTube channel about Mesopotamian food. And you did a stew, and I think one of the herbs was called slave girl's buttocks or something like that. So is there any kind of description of what the plant looked like? I mean, you mentioned it being found on a mountain, so maybe it's a sort of it's alpine a, type plant. Yes, true. But um, it's a myth, and you, you could have a mountain in the underworld where the tip of the mountain mm. is the earth, so it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a mountain in that sense. It's it's really beyond any kind of repeal. The thing mm plant that you mentioned is listed in a there was a late second millennium king called Meridak Baladan and somebody made a, a wonderful tablet about the plants in his garden and we, we have this tablet it's in, in perfect condition and it has vegetables and um, plants and fruits that we know which were for cooking and on the other half of plants which were used in therapy applications by doctors and um, there is one uh, lo lots of plants have fancy names like they do in English like wolf sweat and um, I don't know um, 
things like that, or old man's beard and, and, and what have you, that they had also fancy names for plants, which were just plants. They weren't literally what they sounded like. And mm. slave girl's buttock, this is a very special, hard to find drug. So um, I've never been able to take it any further, I'm afraid. <laughs> Beatrice, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yes, hello. Um, thank you for your um, wonderful talk. Um, I just um, actually sat here making a clay figurine because I was really enthralled by your uh, Mesopotamian magic lecture that's on YouTube. <laughs> right. Can you hear me okay? Yes, 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 yes. Hello? Hello. Yep, we can hear you perfectly, Beatrice. I can hear you too. Hello. Yep. It's literally just frozen. those mesopotamian demons hi can you hear me i don't know how much you heard yeah we can hear you now yeah we heard I oh think. hi sorry um so yeah it was it was um i just wanted to ask a couple of questions one is um how were mages or healers or shamans magic people uh identified was it like a platonic thing where they would uh show an early uh inclination for such abilities or and was there a kind of training involved or was it a lineage was it a bloodline and were they was it hierarchical were, were only the uh kings and the high people uh allowed access to shamans or or was it much more uh disseminated throughout the civilization and how did they look after their shamans? In what ways did they kind of um, work with them? Whether, you know, I, I'm just kind of interested in that kind of like social mechanism of, of what the shaman, how they identified shamans. And then secondly, my second question is regarding um, the kind of literal experience of entities such as gods, as living gods and how, those lit those literal uh, experiences might relate and help us in this current situation on earth where we are right now and how potentially the idea of literal entities or literal gods interacting with us might be useful for us right now right that's quite a lot of stuff well, sorry if, if the first question is that um the, the people who practiced um what we would call healing there were two kinds one one we call, tend to call the exorcist because they use magic spells and things and the other called the asu and they tended to use drugs internally and externally but they worked together they were two sides of a single medical system and the people who did this um I, I, shaman is a bit of a strange word for Mesopotamia, but the, the, the people who did this, they went to school and they were very well trained in writing because it took a long time to learn to read and write cuneiform. And then they became specialists when they entered a sort of guild. So um, the, the Ashipu exorcists and the Asu doctors, they weren't private individuals moonlighting. They were tended to be part of a, a guild. And sometimes it was they were family situations and sometimes not. But if you went from a scribal family, the chances are you become a scribal person. And if you went to scribal school, becoming one of, one of, one of these types of healer would be one of the options that presented itself to you. So people who actually did bedside work, looked at patients and analyzed their condition on, on the basis of their knowledge and recommended treatment. They were very literate, very well trained um persons of in intelligence and all those sorts of things um so uh mostly the medical systems that we find written about were for the, what we might call diseases of the rich that's to say the king and the upper classes and the merchant classes and people who were poor swept the streets and um, ran barrows and lived in the countryside and looked after the land and all that um in, in villages for example um, healing and magic uh, healing and medicine was very likely largely in the hands of 
what you might call some old woman in the village who knew what to do because that's often how it is in many parts of the world and some grandmother who's already had 12 children knows what to do with children know what to do with a burn and know what this means and what that means so they had nothing to do with writing at all the great unwashed population had nothing to do with written healing or writing so what we're dealing with is the upper echelons of society and one thing one can say certainly is that the material which they professed the literary material and the uh, ominous material and the medical material was to some extent secret because they took pains to make sure that people from other lines of work or other cities who might be the same kind of person didn't see their documents they are express about that sometimes so they had this um slight privilege slight um um minority um exclusivity exclusivity about it they, they weren't shamans i mean i don't know what a shaman is i mean from, they didn't have foam at the mouth and have ecstatic experiences and stagger around and speaking in voices or anything of this kind that doesn't happen in mesopotamia as far as i know um the doctors who um we we do know about um they didn't bullshit they operated in a system which was inherited and traditional um they didn't believe in the placebo they didn't manipulate placebos they did what they thought was right and probably quite a lot of it was right because they did it for a very long period of time and most human diseases are self-healing anyway or you die and um so it's like that it's a complex thing to assess but shamans is not quite the it's not quite the word that i would think would fit with these guys it has too many different associations um there is um there were also itinerant healers because the, the, there's a man called bullet um the, the, there's a hymn written by a woman called bullet sarabi who was a, a gula priestess who wrote about a an itinerant doctor and um it sounds like he was unkempt and hairy and unwashed and had a kind of um rasputin type clothing with a rope with things in his pockets and spells and bits and pieces and wandered about barefoot and and healing people like that so there were probably quite a lot of itinerant doctors who or met, met in, in that sense like there always have been in the world who picked things up and knew a bit but they weren't they weren't harley street so to speak um but we have very little external description of any of these people um, we only have these texts and they the texts have to be in, inflated with a bicycle pump to try and get some kind of picture but the the, the hymn of Bulutza Rabbi describes this wandering doctor um with spells in one pocket and bits in another and it's rather a graphic uh, memorable thing so I think you have the, them and you have the smart guys in Uruk and Babylon who very careful very diplomatic and made a lot of money i imagine for example in the first millennium there was um, a, a, an upswing in treatment of what you might call aromatherapy because there were many illnesses which they thought they could be healed by inhaling precious unguents over a brazier um, and there were special unguents for special complaints and as all the unguents um, didn't come from Mesopotamia at all, but had to be imported from Arabia. They were probably rather costly. So it looks to me like there was a sort of trend where, oh, no, you have to have this stuff. And, and well, you've got to pay for it if you want it sort of thing. And um, there were caravans that went to and from Arabia laden down with this stuff, which was spooned out in return for silver by these doctors. So sometimes you get a kind of feeling about what's going on. But I think shamans is not a good word. What was the second thing you asked me about 25 minutes ago? Basically, it was what? Uh, the question I was asking, well, it's very broad, but I find it very comforting to listen to the ancient myths of Sumer and the Mesopotamian stories uh, yeah. and, and myths because it really sort of corresponds with my research into consciousness as someone who has actually projected and remote viewed and wanting to kind of find a map of how 
actually when I'm when I meet entities in astral projection, they do feel like anthropomorphized frequency. They don't feel like it's just a kind of mechanism of my imagination. They feel like that they exist on higher dimensions and that they're appearing down in this kind of physicalized symbolic form towards me. And and essentially I wonder regarding, you know, especially because of this huge emergence of like culturally people are suddenly very interested in the kind of histories of Sumer and Mesopotamia and the teachings of around you know yeah. uh, how that kind of correlates with like multi-dimensionality and you know off-world consciousness or even you know um uh the unified field theory and and I just wondered I imagine when I read and when I listen to these 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 texts that these gods, these living gods, were, were, they're not myths, they're, they're like literal. They were considered as literally existing and embodied it, higher dimensional energy frequent, or, or maybe that's too specific, but well, it was, yeah. they weren't seeing it as, as stories, they were seeing it as reality, or? No, I, th I think no. Uh, they believed in their gods. They really believed in yeah. their gods. They weren't a figure of speech. Yeah, they were literal, and I wonder how. I wonder how that might. I wonder how that kind of helps us. It, it kind of understanding that, like those territories that are often considered imaginary or fictional or mythological. Well, moments in humanity have been considered completely literal. Well, I think um, it, it, it's partly. Um, the, the, the old world uh, worked in such a way um, prior to the appearance of monotheistic religion and prior to the appearance of science. So um, when monotheistic, monolithic um, religion appeared, then religious hostility and trouble began because people say there's only one God and it's my God. And before that, um, it was a free and easy thing. And this is an important matter to try and gauge um, something about what you're asking, because we know this, that when the Assyrian army, for example, um, went over the border into Iran and had a war with the Elamites, when they um, won and sacked their stuff and sorted the earth, they took their gods back to Babylon or back to Assyria, out of their temples. They took them home and added them to their own. And that is a highly significant thing because she's not a um, symbolic deed. The idea is that these gods looked after the Edomite kings for a long time and maybe they're still, got, they're still forced to be reckoned with and we'd rather have them on our side than theirs sort of thing. And um, it's easy to second guess ancient cultures and say, oh, it's all a figure of speech. They didn't really believe it. I think they did definitely believe that gods existed. And I think they believe that ghosts existed and demons and devils. I think they did. And what's, what, what happened subsequently is that the, 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 the preachy um, dominant domination of the, of the monotheological religions, Christianity, Judaism and Islam, had a, um, a, a crushing effect on what you might call the, the natural polytheistic religion system. And the, the polytheistic religious system must have begun, must have lasted all the way through up until then. And that's one of the reasons why um, the old gods, so to speak, which in their day were vital and alive, are always regarded in, by modern persons as not really the case, not really true. You could say, for example, that people who wrote myths about the gods in ancient times were writing about they what we would call pre-historians, because historians write with the benefit of writing. And when you don't have any writing, it's pre-history. And the gods existed in pre-history. So maybe that's their attempt to try and make sense of the world in terms of what they know afterwards. But um that's all I, I can say really. That I, I think there's been a a chain and science of course with its um sweeping skepticism and, and demand for proof has had a very suppressive effect on all sorts of ancient things which ran for a very long time before and i think those two things together explain why 
um, the world is in, in some respects like it is today. Thank you. I'm such a fan. <laughs> Thank you. And I love hearing you speak. I, all of your lectures are so generous and uh, I always learn so much. So it's such an honour to um, be here. So thank you very much. And thanks for your answers as well. It's really nice. Of you. Are there any more questions? Because I ought to go and do something here. So if there are, I mean, do tell me. Otherwise, <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask one quick question about the relationship between the scribal arts and dream interpretation. Um, and dream omens and perhaps rituals as well. You mentioned that a lot of people that would have been trained physicians and doctors were well versed in scribal arts and they learned how to write before they learned how to treat and heal people. In Egypt, there's this conception of writing as being this magical toolkit for affecting change in the world. Is there that same conception in Mesopotamia that if you write something down you can actually change the things of the real world and that um mm. you know in dream interpretation in Mesopotamia you have the same emphasis on wordplay puns and um associations being made through language and linguistics yeah I think if that's true about the Egyptians it's a different universe because the, the Mesopotamian mind was always disposed to look for correlation between cause and effect and meaning because the cuneiform writing system has the property that the individual signs that make up the words have their own range of meanings. And it's possible to take a word or a meaning uh, or a sentence and get out of it secondary and tertiary meanings. And they were very interested in that and from that gaining understanding. But they didn't use, as far as I know, um, language to change the world. I mean, the only way in which they did that was spells which were to drive out evil, um, drive them away, or drive out ghosts, or bring ghosts back to talk to them. Those were magic to effect a change. But um, it's only, it's, it's not the writing which affects the change. The, the magic tried to affect the change. And the tool was the tool for that and lots of other purposes as well so i don't think it's quite the same with the egyptians but you never know with the egyptians i think they mm. were. what do you think about the egyptians i think they were all batty <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, i'll use that <laughs> um thank you so much irving that's been an absolute pleasure so interesting to learn from your wealth of knowledge on this subject and i really hope that you contribute your the rituals that you've deciphered into this compendium of dream moments from mesopotamian with elise and whoever else is working with it that'll be fantastic ah. all right then thank you thank very you much. so much that was brilliant thank you everyone bye bye then bye bye thank you bye thank bye. you bye bye everyone bye bye thank, thank you, you.